So um, good evening, everybody. Dobry večer. Uh, the pr uh, the we're, we're starting from a difficult place because the, the, the very topic of the panel was already meant to be a kind of revision, right? The whole idea that Ukraine has a colonial history is a relatively new idea, and then the idea that perhaps that colonial history could be shared with others is meant to be sort of avant-garde, edgy, and Volodya is now already questioning the premise of the uh, of the title. So we're we're kind of in reflective mode already. So I'm going to try to be less reflective. Um, I, 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 the, the for me, the um, just to say something positive before we get to the question, the the reason why colonial history is intensely in focus now is the present 21st century Russian attitude that you must be like us or you don't exist, or you must be like, a, if you don't wanna be like us, then you shouldn't exist. I would point out though, as a historian, that that's w only one of the many possible colonial attitudes or policies in Ukraine, and that some of the others have been historically more typical. So um, one can also, s w if one looks at the, the, the Russian empire towards Ukraine, the people who ran the Russian empire were not Russians, I mean, let alone Russian nationalists. They generally, I mean, Russia has not been run by a Russia, Russian until extremely recently, like the 21st century. Um, this is not what they teach you in Russian school, I know, but if you're Russian, think about it. Who was the first Russian, whoever really Russian, whoever ruled you, like Yeltsin, basically. So, but the, the Russian Empire was a bunch of Swedes and Baltic Germans and you know Ger and, and Germans, Poles. When the when the Russian Empire governed Ukraine, it was largely governing through big Polish landowners, right? And so, and that's not so different. Um, and then when when the when Great Britain rules the world, you're right, it has maritime colonies, but it tried to you know it tried to rule in the Americas by way of its own people, and they rebelled. And then around the world, it ruled with the help of the Scots and the Irish. And so you're taking some people close to you and you're using them to govern other people far away from you. And then if you look at that pattern, it's not so different from the Soviet Union. I mean, one way to look at Soviet Ukraine is that like imperial powers do, the Soviet Union co-opted one group and, and then used them to rule the rest. And the fact that that wasn't an ethnic group doesn't mean that it's not an empire, right? So in African cases like um, in African cases like Rwanda, the the colonial power invents ethnic groups that weren't there before in order to rule. But you don't have to invent the ethnic group; you can just rule with the help of one part of society against another another part of society. So I'll, I mean, I'll, I, I want to hear what Slavko has to say. But I think there have been all kinds of interesting colonial relationships in U in Ukraine. Um, I want to make sure we talk about this, the Stalinist and the Hitlerian versions before we're done. But I think those versions in Ukraine are not really so different from some of the other kinds of colonial practices that we've seen. Uh, I am not quite happy with the concept of colonial decolonization for the reason is that this is probably one point of our minor controversy here because uh, Ukraine was not a really colony or there was a colony of the Write a colony of the very wrong <coughs> type. Uh, if I refer to some basic book of the European civilization, it's Winnie the Pooh by A. a. Milne. You remember the opening story. Then Pooh went to collect honey and he realized that this is wrong bees and they produced wrong honey. So what I'm saying here, Russia has been wrong empire, therefore it's a wrong colony. <laughs> <laughs> so therefore you could define <laughs> Ukraine as a colony in a sense that starting from the end of 17th century, including so in 18th century, this was Ukrainians who built this empire because they believe this is their empire. Very much like a Scots. They believe that there's the empire and they paved the way to the world status of this empire because though this is their empire. Let me give you one simple point of statistics. By some calculations, the what was the team was Timothy was saying that by the 19th, 18th century, half of all the Russian elites was a matter of fact Ukrainians. Why why 
Ukraine was a wrong colony, Russia was a wrong empire. Not because of the land empire. We have many land empires out of them. What is the wrong about this empire? That in a sense, you have a core which is very much developed, very much civilized, educated in the periphery, which is not the case in the Russian case, in the Russian empire. Because the most developed part of the Russian empire was not the core, was the Western Barlands, Baltic states, Poland, and Ukraine. And therefore, Ukraine was in this kind of opportunity, advantage of being the most educated elites to run the empire, most of this orthodox empire. The story repeats later on with the death of Stalin, because once Khrushchev comes to power, he promotes the Ukrainian elites. And there has been a joke, you probably know this joke, that one of the reasons why Soviet Union has a part has fallen apart, because all the three biggest secretaries of the Communist Party, Khrushchev, Brezhnev, and Gorbachev, they spoke Russian with a heavy Ukrainian accent. But there's one way they were related to Ukraine. As a basic the fact, there is a, <laughs> this is not a joke. I recently wrote a diary of one of the Russian regional of Com Party secretary, which is a high position, so to say. And he was, 70s, end of 70s, he was complaining that Soviet Union is run by Ukrainians, and this is Ukrainian ego, this is much worse than Mongol ego. So what I'm saying, could you imagine a situation in the Portugal Empire that is run by the elites from South America? Or British Empire that was run by elites from the 19th century, India? So this is what makes Ukrainian history that much complicated. I'm not denying colonial status of Ukraine. Sometimes quite very visible. The most visible part of Ukraine as being part of colony is a, is a famine, hold the more. Because the core is denying any kind of measures to help these people in the periphery, that's a colony, without a doubt. That's quite different this in the core. But therefore, so the, the issue is not whether Ukraine was a colony or not, and to what extent was a colony and or not, and to what period was a colony or not. Much this thing is very implicated. The other point is, why Russian empire was a wrong empire or power evil? I don't believe the empire is necessarily evil by itself, because from the most of the global history, empire was the probably the most normal way to organize a state until the First World War, to say. This would be a norm, to say. The point is not about being Russia being empire, but what kind of empire was that? Uh, my friend, my colleague, who's a social linguist from Edinburgh, he made recently a very nice, in simple point, but they never realized that. What he basically said, you could never found a country when Russia is official language and at the same time is democracy. <laughs> you could easily find many countries with English as an official language, which feels wrong uh, as a democracy. German language, Spanish language, but not the case of Russia. So you're not to say by empire itself, but what kind of Russian empire was that? This is the point. So what, if I may write to my conclusion, short conclusion. I believe, yeah, without colonization, it it's, it's, it's not goes without a doubt. It's necessary. It's necessary. But I'm afraid it's not sufficient. <laughs> because we choose as a target this kind of colonial experience by renaming the streets, monuments, all the kind of things, which is a norm, which is good. But we are, touching, we are not touching the essence of the empire, which is lack of any kind of political rights. There is no tradition of the democracy or so short. Just put a very simple question. I would say the, the I would say Mahmoud Handi test. How long Mahmoud Handi would, uh, do Handi has uh, any chance to emerge in the Russian empire? What would be his chance to survive Soviet empire for three days? So what I'm say, so saying here that basically I believe that the Russian Empire by itself has a kind of left a very strong legacy on Ukraine because this is empire, how should I say, of oppression, of violence, all kinds of things. So if I may to finish that things, that Ukrainians started as a Scots of the Russian Empire, but they finished as Irish. <laughs> because the way of the idea how this Russian Empire who looked like has felt totally. And then the solution to that, to build another state as the opposition. Therefore, has an irony, which is kind of irony, that the Ukrainians has been bo overrepresented in the running elites and among dissidents. Very much like a Jewish case, so to say. So what I'm saying again and again, 
that yes, the conversation is a must, uh, and I'm afraid that we're talking about conversation very often because it's nicer, it's easier, it's a part of our job description. It's make us to think that we're important. But I believe for the kind of real decolonization, political reforms would do much more to just get rid of this colonization, the colonial, the colonial empire. Thank you. I just there are three more people who need to talk, but I just I, I need to defend the. <laughs> all right, um, there are three more people I'd like to hear talk, uh, but I want to just defend the premise a little bit more. I mean, I think the reason why we think of Ukraine having a colonial history is is unusual, but maybe in a different way. And that is that th there's a very intense period of the colonization, colonization of Ukraine from, let's say, 1930 to 1944, when um, Ukraine is subject to a Stalinist form of colonization where Stalin is quite explicitly saying that Ukraine and other rich, rich parts of the Soviet Union will serve as a substitute for our colonies. And he is explicitly modeling Soviet modernization on Western style colonial modernization. And then on top of that, you have Hitler who says, I'm going to undo the Soviet modernity because these are in fact peasant colonial peoples and they should be starving not for Stalin, they should be starving for us. So Hitler meant to colonize the Soviet Union, but he also meant to specifically colonize the Ukrainians, who he regarded as a colonial people. Um, he believed that Ukrainians would happily serve Germans after Germans put a pole in the middle of the village and put a radio on top. And then if they did that, the Ukrainians would dance around the pole. He believed that if you brought beads to Ukrainian villages, the Ukrainians would be fascinated by the beads and would love the Germans for it. This was Hitler's idea of a colonial people. And of course, that model of colonialism also killed millions. So there's this very intense period of colonization, which is almost too intense because both Stalin's and Hitler's idea of colonization were derivative of what they thought had happened in the past 500 years. They were catch-up colonizations where they were trying to pile a whole bunch of things into a few years that had happened other places over 500. And both Stalin and Hitler were explicit about this. Hitler said, we have to do in the, in the Soviet Union in, I'm paraphrasing, I'll have it slightly wrong, but we have to do in the Western Soviet Union in years what we, that is to say the Nordic Europeans, did in America in centuries. So that is really intense colonization. And then what, what Putin is doing in a way is that he's going back and dipping into both the Stalinist and the Hitlerian experiences. Um, so it's, a, it's, an odd, it's an odd kind of situation because the colonization is based upon what tyrants thought previous colonization was like. But at the same time, I don't think we can, we can reduce it, right, to, to the 20th century. Because if you look at the 18th century, w the, hi the history of Ukraine in the 18th century is precisely the expansion of Russian imperialism uh, to, including to Ukrainian lands. And uh, what is this Catherine's version of the Russian Empire is not, if not uh, taking some kind of uh, European idea and just perverting it and, and creating a uniform space, right? So we, we, we really can go uh, deep into the past with that. But uh, I, I would agree with what Yaroslav is saying, but uh, not slightly so, because yeah, we, we can describe many things how Ukrainians actually contributed to creating Russian empire. But were they building Ukrainian empire? They, bu they were building Russian empire. Uh, and this is this is also explained. They were building Orthodox Empire, for example, and uh, or they were building something unpredictable that they couldn't predict actually. And this is the story of uh, Fan Prokopovich for me. He was not really uh, aiming was aiming to build the Peter's Peter style of, of the empire. But let me let me turn to Neil, who is not going to talk, but <laughs> I, I will ask him to talk. Uh, if we look at the global history, because for us, uh, for, for me personally, there is a clear pattern of opposing the republican idea of politics and the imperial idea of politics. And uh, what Yaroslav said, that in the, in the empire actually tries to 
erase rights. I would say that empire is a is a polity which has a clear center but doesn't have borders. So it's it's always in this mood of expansion. And when we look at the Russian ideology today, at Eurasia Eurasianism, for example, we see that very clearly. So Dugin is clearly saying that if we are not expanding, we will shrink. At the same time, there is a republican model, and I, I, I think we can trace it through the Greek city-states, through Italian city-states or German city-states in the, in the medieval times, through the uh, uh, American uh, idea, which, which goes very much deeply to the ancient idea and, and revives it. And of course, through the post French Revolution Europe, which would say that uh, a good polity is a republic, and republic does have borders, but not necessarily has a single center. Would you agree with that? That we can look at the global history in that way? Oh, it's total nonsense. It's wonderful to be a Scotsman in a conversation like this. <laughs> <laughs> the Ukrainians are the Scots. And the problem with the whole analogy is that it's not like the Russians and the English have much in common, let's be honest. <laughs> I mean, I don't think if we did the Russians south of the border, our history would have been quite the way it was. But let me address your question. I agree with Yaroslav. Most of what we call history is the history of empires. Republics are these exceptions for most of history, and the typical insight of ancient and Renaissance political theory was that there are reasons they don't last. There are reasons they quickly revert to aristocracy or, or to tyranny. The, the demos is inherently un, an unstable basis for uh, governance. So it's only very recently in history that we get the idea that nation state, that republics uh, are nation states are the way to go. And we're even inconsistent about that. Because look how many of today's nation states are still monarchies. What's that all about? They're not republics. If your nice, elegant theory was right, monarchy would have gone long ago. But monarchy's done really well, much better in, say, the Middle East than republics. So I think we need to take a step back and recognize that most of what we call history is about empires. But you have to recognize that there are multiple kinds of empire. And you have to distinguish between settler colonization uh, and forms of empire, let's think of the way the Habsburg Empire functioned, which just basically amalgamated different uh, ethnicities, different uh, jurisdictions through dynastic alliances. You can use the word empire to describe all these things, but really, it's, it's an incredibly heterogeneous uh, collection of polities that you're, you're talking about. I don't think the word colonialism is helpful because it confuses people from the very minute it's uttered. And in fact, as you introduced this discussion, you alluded to a kind of uh, car the cartoon version of British imperialism or of French imperialism, uh, which in a, in a way is 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 beside the point the most successful of the British colonies were, was these massive settler enterprises in North America. Tiny, trivial numbers of people ran British India uh, and created this unitary entity which hadn't existed before out of multiple uh, kingdoms. So I think that the problem with framing Ukrainian history as part of some grand narrative of decolonization is that you do a great violence to the complexity of, of empire. Uh, and I think you then imply a certain future uh, for Ukraine, which is, oh, it's time for us to do decolonization. This is the wrong way to think about, about your history. The, wh the reason I welcome the analogy with British history that, that both Timothy and Yaroslav brought up is that once you start looking at Britain, the great, this extraordinary thing, the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland, it's almost impossible really to craft the narrative, the, the standard cartoon narrative of wicked oppressors and the, the subjugated, because there they, are, there they are, the Scots running the show, overrepresented in the, in the elites. And, and I think 
my caution in this discussion is don't take off the shelf Edward Said and say that it's time to decolonize Ukrainian culture. That, that seems to me like a massive blind alley. Better to recognize the complexity of European political geography, uh, to recognize, and Timothy's work has been so influential in this, that Ukraine was subject to the most extreme forms of what one might call bastard imperialism in the mid-20th century. Th there was a strange sense in which the Soviet Union and Hitler's empire were ghastly mirror images of one another, but they were kind of cartoon versions of what they thought had been done in the 19th century for the West. So I, I do think there's, there's a need to, to reframe the trajectory that Ukraine is on now and not to end up in a place where 10 years from now in Kyiv people are debating decolonizing the curriculum. Let's not read Tolstoy. You don't want to end up there. Well, that's not where you should be. This is this is where you don't want to be. It'll be like it would be as absurd for the Scots to stop reading Shakespeare because oh dear, he was from Stratford. I mean, please don't descend into that kind of petty petty nationalism. Then you'll simply become Philistines, and there'll be no future for the country. I think we are doing a different different thing. I think we are uh, first. There is a, a job of finding your own names and finding your own stories. And this is not something that, it's not about not reading Tolstoy, it's, it's about reading our own writers. And I don't think that uh, Ukrainians need to be lectured whom to read, right? Uh, at the same time, there is a huge work to be done to reread Tolstoy and reread Dostoevsky and reread Pushkin. And then the question is, okay, y you refer to Edward Said, so if we read Flaubert and Kipling in a, in a, in a post-colonial way, why should we read uh, Russian literature in that way? And believe me, there is lots of things to do because there are so many blind spots. So again, just returning to your argument, it's, it's more complicated than that. It's not just about you know, waging a war with, uh, with monuments. But let me address to Natalia, because it's a very, when we look at the present, it's a very, uh, it's a very important question how the new colonization is going on. And uh, it's not only about, so we are kind of uh, talking about post-colonialism, decolonialism, but we are also talking about recolonization. And uh, when we, you and me, we're traveling a lot of, across Ukraine, we talk to the people from the occupied territories, and what, what I personally noticed that uh, there is, uh, it's, 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 a, it's a little bit different. It's, it's not only about physical extermination, and it's not even so much about physical e extermination. It's about an attempt to reprogram people, to change the school curricula to change their identity, to, so to work much more in the assimilation mood than simply in extermination mood. And I think if we look back in the Ukrainian-Russian relations over the past several centuries, we have this pattern. What do you think? Uh, it's fascinating for me how this panel ended up to be about everything and everybody has very special ideas about what we need, what we want to talk about the colonies. So I'll answer what you, um, what you said, but I really first want to return to the initial title of the panel. Can Ukraine share and tell the story of its colonial past? Uh, and I believe that the only way to do that is really to learn the story of other colonial past before because you really unable because before we were taught the stories of empires we really don't have another idea of how the world is built so we before we want to share our story would it be a story to share with indians or even with wherever uh, the legacy of the french empire in algeria whether we would speak to french or algerians or you know the other way uh, w you know people in the latin america and then to, to, to their empires, we kind of don't fully understand their stories, to be honest. And 
Um, I'm speaking in this panel, uh, you know, I'll, I want to speak about some empirical uh, e experience uh, based on my, my, my recent jobs, which are the two projects we do. And they turn to be connected because one is about the documenting war crimes and really what you said, going to the field, talking to the people, looking at the results of the uh, occupation. But recently we've also brought a group of the number of the groups, editors, senior intellectuals from Latin America and from Africa, from Kenya and Nigeria, from Brazil and Chile. And uh, in every their interaction with the Ukrainians from Kherson, who lives through the through the occupation, uh, the Ni Nicaraguan would speak about, you know, like th the shared history. The South African would relate. The Kenyan would be very, very interested into the story of Holodomor, of, and would, you know, especially when you look at the story of the uh, genocide in Namibia, for instance, which you know has become uh, used later and from done by the Germans, then learned by the Turks, then also partially picked up by Stalin. So we see this cycle of the history. That would be very interesting for everybody. And I saw that it works. Anytime I myself today working with this and trying to reach out to the people would listen to the story, you know, to, to look at the, to, to look a recent about book of the history from Nigeria, that would be the phrase I would explain the Russian occupation with the talk that they want us to be the second class citizens. You know, and that would be from the Nigerian history book I pick up. I would learn from that because I feel it, I see it. Maybe, you know, for me, it's not a comparison of the history, but comparison of my present, of something I see today, with a lot what I, uh, w what I, what I read. And uh, I, as today, as a Ukrainian, with this sensitivity, I really better would understand, you know, the war between Pakistan and Bangladesh, you know, because that was exactly the war when the part of the population was told that you are Pakistani, you are not, you know, you are not different. Uh, so there are a lot of things to tell this story. However, what was interesting that when we tried to brought these groups of people, especially from outside, in the discussions like this with the Ukrainian intellectuals or with the Ukrainian politician, as long as world colonialism appeared, as long as we started to speak narratives, there was a backslash. The very same people who related a minute ago started to explain why, you know, like, don't speak colonialism because it's about Columbus. For us, it's about, you know, British doing particular thing in Nigeria. And I was also thinking that, you know, maybe it's not the way to speak to the general public. Maybe it's not the way to speak to the journalist. Maybe it's just so far an idea to discuss in academia. And I was really, really thinking, I was asking the questions to team, you know, how to deal with that as well. And I think the point is that colonialism is really about trauma and it's about something very personal. Really, when we try to really just share a colonial, you know, like the history of colonialism, we have, we can jump into this trap of comparing victims, vic our victimhood, whose past is worst, who is a bigger victim, and nobody would ever accept disregarding that I'm a smaller victim because your pain is the biggest pain. It should be respected, disregarding, you know, how grave it was. So I do think that uh, the way, as I said, first of all, is to learn. And uh, but now referring to your question, yes, you see, for me, this analogy I already brought from Nigeria about trying to say like, you second class citizen, you just should to admit that you'll be there like that. You know, just admit you'll leave. But the point was that the Ukrainians don't want to do that. All the rest things, wherever historian from any country, I believe, would come and who learned about any colonization in recent past, would it be, you know, British in Kenya, would it be Japanese in South Korea? I, I would probably speak about last century, you know, I wouldn't go to the Columbus time, I'm, I'm really speaking about all the uh, genocidal wars and uh, colonization of, of, of the last century, would figure out and would see the something in current Ukrainian, you know, um, present, 
about what's happening in occupied territories that they've seen in their history, from the deportation to <laughs> to of the children to you know taking the bread to you know changing the curriculums and the attitude. So I really think that's that would be the way we need to learn first, and we would probably avoid grand narratives because even in this room, just putting this the world colonial, we really. T Everybody of us talked about something totally different. Something not totally. You, 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 you are more or less in, in, in you know, m we're more coherent. But something which probably we just wanted to express about colonialism, which is for everybody, is a very loaded term. So that that means that we we start with stories and uh, avoid general concepts, which uh, for me as a philosopher is a is a very bad thing. <laughs> uh, but. Uh, I do think that we can uh, we can we can Please stick to speech. we can we can stick a little bit to general I think concepts Claudia as well. I said like maybe picking up the audience, maybe not pushing too much, maybe understanding to somebody, but at least not at this stage. Yes, but at the same time, uh, we can think about how, l as as Neil was saying, how different empires were, and we can also talk about how different imperialisms are and war or colonialisms. And that leads me to, to uh, Happy Man, actually. Uh, I also do have this impression of what Natalka is saying, that when we come to Kenya or South Africa or India and use the vocabulary that is, you know, developed in the 20th century uh, in this, you know, col uh, imperialism, colonialism, cultural imperialism, we kind of uh, go into the situation when this vocabulary is perceived as valid for certain parts of the world and you can really try very hard to say that look similar or maybe a little bit different but similar things were happening in Europe for example can we actually say that when you talk from India about Europe you talk about the Western Europe while what was happening in Eastern Europe and the same question, for example, how can we, when we talk about slavery, can we talk about serfdom as a kind of a parallel? Can we, can we think about the, the literature, the Ukrainian literature, Staras Shevchenko or, or Markov of Chok as, as, a, as a examples of a Bolshevist literature? Can we, can we think in that way? Or this will be a, a total um, miscomprehension. What do you think? Well, what do I think? I'm confused. Um, <laughs> but I think confusion is a good thing, right? I mean, um, it it's sort of uh, makes you think about things more deeply. I think one of the questions that is coming up quite uh, strongly is the question that you are trying to raise. What is a colonial experience? Um, is it uh, merely the direct physical invasion of a country and the exploitation of that country? Or is it more than that? Is it about an imperial attitude? Is it about, um, you know, uh, hegemony? Is it about imposing certain values on others? Um, or is it about denying political agency to an entity? I think I'll probably stick with that. I mean, it's, it's denying political agency to an entity. If I mean, I, I sort of like the distinction that you made in the beginning about uh, sameness versus hierarchy. It's either sameness or a hierarchy. I think that's what that's what you're getting at. Uh, you know, I coming from India, I have a slightly different feeling. Let let me sort of put that out. There is, on the one hand, the sameness argument in the global order today, right? The global values, global order, international law. I mean, we should all be abiding to the same values, same international order, same international law. That's the sameness part of it. On the other hand, there is also hierarchy. Who will decide what is order? Who will decide what is whose values? What values? I mean, you have no place there. I mean, I come from the, I come from the global south. I mean, I have no place when you decide whose order, whose values. So both are imposed on me. On the one hand, I am asked to sort of abide by certain values. On the other hand, I have no place in the global institutions that decide those values. So I think there is a certain underlying hypocrisy here, right? I mean, 
we talk about democratic values, you expect uh, the other countries to abide by a certain global order, international law. At the same time, you deny those countries the agency or the ability to sit at the table with you and decide what those values are. That sounds like organized hypocrisy. Of course, I'm borrowing from Steve Cra uh, Stephen Krasner's book, but uh, that is organized hypocrisy, unfortunately. Let me stretch that logic because I think I was told that this is uh, the nightcap. We are supposed to discuss things frankly and talk about things frankly, of course. Yes, uh, there is the invasion of Ukraine by Russia. Uh, there is the attack that is deplorable to be condemned. But this afternoon, we also had George Bush addressing us. Um, did he have the permission of the UN Security Council or the UN General Assembly to invade Iraq in 2003? No, he did not. Kofi Annan, the Secretary General, said at that point of time that he did not abide by the United Nations. So, I'm, I'm, so here is a frank question. I mean, I'm an academic, I can ask any questions, right? Uh, why did we have him um, speak to us this afternoon? Uh, I think these are disturbing questions. Uh, if we have to talk honestly about colonial experience, colonialism, what is a colonial experience? We go to ask these questions, hard questions to ask us. It, it can't be a nice, hungry-dory story that we listen in the evening and go, back, go to sleep. I just want to sort of put that out there. May, may, may Thank you <coughs> very much. Uh, may I ask you also, because I'm also struggling how to deal with that. Uh, we recently also had the very same discussion with the group of very senior Syrian <coughs> civil society leaders who came to Ukraine exactly to say that we were in this spot that there were so many global injustice. And wherever we, we go, especially outside of, 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 of Europe, uh, that would be the question raised, uh, you know, like, but how about, you know, Iraq? How about Bush? How about that? Which is the right question to ask. Or what, what is interesting, or, or would be the question for, for me to ask, asked about, like, and how about supporting Syrians? Interesting enough, the questions won't be asked often by Syrians. I later figure out that Syrians are actually very much in favor of supporting Ukraine. But to be honest, often as an excuse, not to do something. You know that the global hypocrisy is our excuse for inaction. So my question would be, can we reframe it? So not doing something wrong, not having a trial of George Bush shouldn't be the reason and explanation of not having the trial uh, if it's necessary against Vladimir Putin. So maybe you'll help us, you know, how to rephrase this idea that, you know, that we, we shouldn't build just saying that, oh, it, it's hypocritical. So then do nothing because it's just unfair. Can we bring more kind of positive thing and constructive way on thinking like that? As it's, uh, as it's yeah. quite a feel, what I felt like with, with talking to my Syrian colleagues, quite an unfair thing that, you know, Syrians were also sometimes denied support just exactly because of the very unfair and unfortunate war which had you know, been... Uh, no, no, I would not have George engaged in this what about um, and, and that is classic what about I mean, the question about it. Uh, what about George Bush? Of course, that's just what about But I would not have made that argument had he not addressed the audience this afternoon. I mean, you know, in a conversation about the invasion of Ukraine, about uh, Ukraine being colonized, you have brought in someone who is of controversial... Uh, who has done controversial things, clearly controversial things. That's my, that, that's not what about, what about me. I'm just sort of showing a mirror. And, and then that, I'm, I'm riding on the back of that to make the argument that there is a certain organized hypocrisy when it comes to sameness versus hierarchy. We expect follow the global order, international law, democracy, all of that is good. Where is democracy in international institutions? Where is democracy in global order? Whose order is it? So when it comes to that, of course, it is about hierarchy. It doesn't work that way. I just want to sort of show that mirror, that's all. C can I just jump in with a couple of observations? I mean, that I don't think we should equate uh, the invasion of Iraq 20 years ago with the invasion of Ukraine. Because only, I think, uh, the crudest leftist would, would say that that was a project of American imperialism. Uh, you won't meet many Iraqis who say, gosh, we, we do miss Saddam Hussein. Uh, 
Iraq is now a, a democracy. It's a not a terribly stable one. Uh, but the objective of the de deposition of Saddam was not to create an American colony in the Middle East. If it was in the minds of some neoconservatives, they, they failed miserably. Tim? So I, I want to I pick up on, on uh, Happy Mon's paradoxes and, uh, and then I want to say something. I want to catch up to Natalia too. So um, here's the thing. Uh, like, so at the time in 2003, I said that this is, um, that our invasion of Iraq was stupid and criminal and so on, right? But the only way I could say that it was criminal was by referring to accepted standards of international law. If I toss those out, then my claim that it's a criminal war is just kind of my opinion, right? And so what follows from that is that, you know, if, if, you're, if, you, if your claim is that the, the international law that we have, you know, is forcing us all to be the same and that's bad, how then can you criticize George Bush? Like on what basis exactly do we criticize George Bush? Because that just puts you in the position of being the hypocrite who wants everyone to be the same, right? Because like, why can't George Bush just do whatever he wants? So I guess I'm, I mean, I'm all in favor of hypocrisy because without, because hypocrisy is recognition that there are rules. And I agree with you completely. There can be better rules and there can be worse rules and there can be better, but if we don't have hypocrisy, then there are no rules at all, right? Because being human is basically organized hypocrisy. That's, that's what we are. We are, <laughs> well, you're living better than me in that case, my friend. Um, but we are organized. We are organized hypocrisy. And if we throw out the if we throw out the hypocrisy, then we're also throwing out the rules. And then we are really left where the Russians want us to be, which is that th I mean, their literal claim is there are no rules and there cannot be rules and it's only power. And that's not a view which I think is helpful, you know, for for anyone. So I'm just like the hypocrisy thing. I think cuts both ways. Because you can say, well, you know, how do you criticize the Russians? Da -da, but then you also can't criticize Bush. Like my view would be they're both illegal invasions. Yeah, okay. So on slavery and serfdom, I, I just want to take Natalia's point in a slightly different way. Because Natalia's talking about the things where she's done work and, you know, the thing where I do the most work, although sometimes I follow her around and learn things, um, is in history. And so, like, Natalia's point, one of her points was, we go places and we learn things, and then we realize we have to. We realize we have to learn more. And I want to make the same point about history. So when we ask, sh can Ukraine share its colonial history? We first have to then figure out what Ukrainian history is, right? But like before, like the question about serfdom is interesting, but you don't actually have to put it in terms of a comparison. I mean, the, the where we are sitting right now was once the global capital of slave trading. I mean, the very word Slav comes from Arabic al-Saklabi because these are the people who were traded for slaves, these people. The, the Slavic word Slovo, which means speech, was converted by way of Arabic into German and English into our word for slave, and there was a reason for that, which is that this was the slave trading capital of the world. To the point that in, in, in Hebrew, the word for Rus was Canaan because biblical Canaan was the land of slavery. Right, so this is a homeland of slavery, among many other things, and the achievement of Rus, the state, was to, was to eventually stop the, the people who founded this country, were slavers, and their achievement was they went from being slavers to people who organized a more legal regime with farming and so on. Right, they were Viking slavers. So we don't have to kind of leap to an analogy. We can just say, okay, but if we learn more about Ukrainian history, we learn there's a lot of slavery in it, and then we can compare slavery with slavery. And then the other point of Natalia's, which I wanted to echo, and it, um, it goes to your question about, like, can you compare? I think it, like, and here I'm going to be sim sympathetic with what, with what Hoffman was saying. It depends a little bit on who's doing the comparison, right? So when I was, um, like, when I, the last year I taught, I taught, um, I taught for a semester uh, a class in prison, and it happened to be exactly when the war in Ukraine started. And my students were almost entirely African Americans. 
And, uh, and so we ended up doing a lot of Ukrainian history because they were very interested in the war. And they were very interested, particularly, it should be said, in the colonial aspect of the war. I mean, unlike us, <laughs> they jumped on that right away because like that was their, like, that was their basic paradigm, was, was America as a colonial project, the United States as a colonial project. And then they were, you know, and they were working, so that was where they started and like, and they were very, they were able to think, okay, Ukraine, is that like an American colonial project or is it somebody else's colonial project? That's where they were, right? And by the end of the semester, one of the guys um, who'd been in prison for 32 years, I think at that point, 32 years, he, he, did the, he wrote the following paper. He wrote a paper about how during the Holodomor, Ukrainians would read Uncle Tom's Cabin by Harriet Beecher Stowe, which is a famous American book about slavery. And they would, they, they would read it in the light of the Holodomor and say, okay, we are now identifying with these people. And he, as an African American, was identifying with the Ukrainians who were identifying with the slaves, right? But that was him doing that. That was not me saying, I mean, I think I might be making, you know, the same point. That you're, I was not saying like, hey dude, like let's talk about how this is all like colonial. He was making those connections on the basis of like wh where he found himself reading and what he was experiencing. And just like on this point, it was very interesting for me to watch these African American guys. I mean, this, you know, we don't, you know, as they learn more about Ukrainian history, identifying with Ukrainians, which is like not, which is interesting, right? Which was interesting. And it may, like, I don't want to push it too far because, again, they're not here to make the arguments themselves, but it may push a little bit in the direction of there being a, a, a something like a colonial history to share. I mean, you have to ask them what they mean by colonial, right? But it was interesting to see how the more they learned about the war and the more they learned about the kinds of, like, the specific things that were happening in the war, the more they said, okay, like, we get this. We identified with these people. Thank you. Yaroslav? I do believe that Ad Edward Sayir was a great scholar. And I believe it makes sense to read him for Ukrainians. What I dislike, that when Edward Sayir is used as excuse for our failures. Because it has been colony, therefore we should not have that or that and that and that. This is I, this I could not stand, so to say. So what I'm saying here, if Ukraine has something to share, as a colonial experience, is exactly that Ukrainians are denying those colonial experience. The slaves that choose not to be slaves, but slaves who say run against their destiny, so to say, historical destiny, and they try to be free people, so to say. Natalia brought me at one point to the group of the journalists from the South of America, and I tried to use this kind of example of comparison that they've been a colony and we've been a colony, and I failed. I totally failed. It doesn't tell to them. Oh, your much. brilliance. Yeah. No, that's how I felt because I know it doesn't really work. Because basically, they have been a colony in the 19th century. They're not colony anymore. We couldn't use the excuse of the colonialism to explain what happened to Argentina nowadays, so the things it is. Because there's a deeper factor that runs, runs along, 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 along uh, these this, uh, this, uh, lines. I don't know. <coughs> to end up because there's kind of late time and uh, things are going. The basic thing is I do believe that Ukraine has a some very successful story to tell. This is what I believe the most important point. Thank you, Roslav. Colleagues, we actually run out of time, so I really would love to give you really one minute. Natalia and then Neil and then Hatima. So I would to summarize, I would be extremely cautious about uh, and tell, make the story with absolute respect, because I think still, with all my interaction with anybody, I understand that even the traumas of the 19th century are so deep in the people of different countries, and we as Ukrainians, in particular, can understand that more than anybody else, and therefore, I my urge is that Ukrainians understand how sensitive we are should understand also how sensitive anything they speak while approach the others should be. But I want to finish with uh, what Yaroslav passed me. Yes, it would be very depressing. It can be a very depressing story if we just <laughs> share our story of colonialism. I do feel when we speak to the people around the world, this idea of hope and of future, for me, the answer is, in fact, we are taking from them 
you know, their experience also to learn because we facing colonialism now, you know, very much, you know, in a very extreme way today. But we also can give a bit of the future to understand how to, you know, go on in the modern world. Uh, and and we, we do give a lot of examples and inspiration for people in the places where things are very, very difficult still today. Neil? I'm an economic historian, and in this conversation there's been too little discussion of the objective realities, if I can use that phrase, of uh, imperial or colonial structures. What is interesting is... Who is exploiting whom uh, and which uh, uh, people have access to elite membership? And the, the, the last point I want to leave you with is don't think that exit from empire does away with the problem uh, of exploitation and restricted access uh, to the elites and therefore political agency. The, the, gr the greatest hypocrisy of the 20th century uh, it really began in the 19th, was to believe that creating nation states would magically solve the problems. And saying that everything bad is colonialism gives that an alibi to bad nation states. Latin America is full of them. Places where the levels of oppression are actually far worse than in some of the more liberal empires that have existed in history. So one reason that I push back against this framing of everything as somehow decolonization versus colonialism is that it gets the nation states off the hook. Thank you. Well, I'll just wi end with one, say, two sentences. One is, I think, um, you know, one man's or woman's order is the other, another man's uh, colonial experience. Um, and I'm, I'm delighted that you said that. Let's acknowledge that this is organized hypocrisy. Uh, and I think, I think that's that's a great way of looking at it because. If we don't acknowledge that there is a certain amount of hypocrisy in in underlying the ceremonizing and the preaching and the um, you know system shaping sort of arguments and all all of that, I think then we are going to be too far too evangelical about it. It's good to know that it is a hypocritical enterprise at the end of the day. Uh, and I think my second point really is it is important to look at colonized experience or colonial experience beyond the physicality of it. Uh, it. It exists at a very different level for a variety of countries, at the level of uh, um, rules, at the level of imposition of those rules, uh, the, the, the dictation of a certain kind of order from a certain part of the world, etc. So don't just look at military invasion. Of course, that is the worst form of it, but there's life beyond that. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. Happy Mon, Neil, Natala, Timothy, Yaroslav. I think we only started uh, a topic, actually. And I would like to, I would love to spend the night uh, discussing that, but we have a curfew in this country. And uh, I wish all of us uh, have a future and have hope despite this new recolonization. Thank you, thank you very much. <laughs>